Hey everybody, it's Nat from Nat's Numbers and I am back today to do a Q&A session here on YouTube for a viewer named Kristen. So she's a life path number three and here's what she writes. Hey Nat, I very much connect to the vibration of what the three holds. A need for self-expression through creativity, joy, optimism, and playfulness. Yet, at this moment, I'm feeling very stuck and creatively blocked. I'm not able at the moment to work freely on my passions, for the restrictions in my life are very much present through parental forces. And I love that term, parental forces. We have conflicting values and opinions, and there are definitely control issues. How do I tap into that inspirational flow of creativity when I feel repressed and restricted by others? Okay, Kristen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a story with you that perfectly personifies this dynamic of being the three creative eternal child meeting up with a repressive restrictive factor in life. So I have this amazing, wonderful, expressive friend, and we are walking through the park one day, and she decides to throw down her purse and do cartwheels through the grass. And I'm standing there, reveling in the spontaneity of her and, and the beauty of who she is. And she's this 40-something woman, right? So it's like she's so in touch with that, with that internal child. And as I'm watching her, right behind her in my view is a woman on a park bench. And I'm watching this woman on the park bench start to get upset as she's watching my friend engage in this playfulness. Now, instead of walking out of the park on the cement path, she decides to walk out of the park through the grass right by my friend. And with incredible, visceral, nonverbal cues, she communicates to my friend through a hostile, disagreeable, judgmental look that what she's doing is unacceptable and disgusting. I've never seen a look like this before, especially instigated uh, by a complete stranger. Now, two things came up for me witnessing this. Number one, an incredible curiosity at what just happened. And number two, a, a overwhelming disgust for what I just observed. This is what so many of us deal with when we allow that innocent, open, and creative child to come out into the world. We are met with the park bench woman, a restrictive, repressive factor that somehow sends us the message that there's a part of us that is unacceptable. There are these two stories that come to mind that came out in the 1930s and I think 1950s. It's Little Orphan Annie, which was initially a comic strip and then became the movie, and then Pollyanna. And both of these movies depict the innocent, sunshiny child who is mired in a uh, corrupt adult world. And both of these characters, Annie and Pollyanna, both orphans, seem to have this, this irrepressible optimism that they direct towards these disillusioned, jaded adults in their lives. Now, this is so incredibly interesting to me because we all have that bench park woman. And in the case for you, Kristen, it could be your parents, right? And in these stories of Pollyanna and Annie, it was, for Annie, it was, um, ooh, what was it for Annie? It was Mrs. Hannigan, and for Pollyanna, it was Aunt Polly. And both of these figures represent what happens if the three superpower of expression and optimism is repressed and inhibited long enough. It segues into the villain phase of the superpower, the villain phase being toxigenesis, being a almost uncontrollable discharge of negativity, judgment, blame, and complaining, okay? Here's the thing within these stories and for your parents. With every repressive factor, they represent the unlived life. So for Mrs. Hannigan, the unlived life was not being able to be seen, not being able to be the child 
well received by the world that she wanted to. In fact, there's a brilliant scene in the movie where the millionaire's secretary comes to adopt a child. And Miss Hannigan says, you can adopt any child here in this orphanage except Annie. Because Annie was a representation of the part of herself that was repressed. The part of herself that she learned was absolutely unacceptable, ugly, and disgusting. Okay, and the same thing with Aunt Polly. Aunt Polly was was stoic and serious and was never allowed to let loose, was never allowed to see beyond the concept of duty and responsibility. So the first thing that you need to ask yourself to get through this creative block is what is the unlived life in your familial environment? You can go so far as asking that park bench woman or your parents what is your unlived life? What is your biggest regret? What is the biggest regret in your life? Interview them. Try to understand why there is such a charge on, uh, on expression. Why is there such a emotional, visceral, visceral reaction to this concept of openness and free-flowing creativity? There is always a story there and it will be an absolute revelation. What is the unlived life that your father, that your mother is not speaking, okay? When you become aware of that, it allows you to not take it so personal. You're able to, just like Annie and Pollyanna in both of these stories, you're able to see it for what it is, right? It's somebody who has not yet tapped in to the, the option of innocence, the option of optimism. Okay, the second thing that I want you to understand is what you have to lose. So I, I think the artist archetype in our society is considered to be almost this selfish, irresponsible archetype, which is why the fool, the clown, is associated with it. And I, and I find it incredibly upsetting that we link those together, that the creative artist is also associated with sort of these uh, stupid, ignorant characters, okay? So the thing that you have to realize is that you have a tremendous amount to lose, not only in a personal sense in terms of your quality of life and your success as a human being, but the world has a lot to lose if you don't show up within the context of your true authentic optimism self. So in 1966, one of the first mass school shootings happened in Texas. And it, it happened in such a way that it was, it was so disturbing because we, we didn't even understand how it could have happened. This guy named Charles, what was it? yeah, Charles Whitman. He was one of the youngest American boys to become an Eagle Scout. He was a, a, an altar boy. He had no criminal record. But one day he decided to drive onto a university, get up in the tower, and shoot dozens of people and kill them. And the Texas government, the state government, was so disturbed by this. The governor at the time, John Connolly, he decided to amass a tremendous amount of resources to get this expert panel to figure out how could somebody engage in such a villainous behavior? And he hired psychologists, sociologists, neurologists, toxicologists, I mean, all of these different people to figure out what it was. And you would think that with all of these different varieties of people, they'd come up with different theories. But what they came up with was that when they researched criminals that could engage in such behavior, they found one common factor. And this common factor was play deprivation. So Charles Whitman and other people like him grew up in incredibly restrictive, dogmatic environments where they weren't allowed to play. They weren't allowed to be free to be a kid and to use their imagination. What, a, what, what an incredible conclusion that they came to of how important being a kid and playing really is. So what do you have to lose? Not only do you have to lose your quality of life because play is associated 
with incredible innovation and creativity and moving forward by leaps and bounds in our society. But we're also talking about the bigger picture here, that if you repress and inhibit yourself long enough, it comes out and you become a toxic force in the world. You become a contributor. You become the bench park woman who is saying to people that it is not okay to enjoy this experience of life. All right, so what's the ultimate solution? to this problem, right? Number one, figure out what the unlived life is so that you don't take it as personal, so you have context and understanding. But the most important thing is to play, to bust through that creative block, to overcome the, restrict the restriction that you're experiencing in your familial environment is to play. Now, Dr. Stuart Brown, who was one of the people on this panel, he's a play researcher and a psychiatrist, and, and he says that as adults, the way to engage with play again, um, there's some fun ways to do that. Number one, he says, do a play history. And it's basically where you go back and journal on what did you love doing when you were a kid? What kind of play did you engage in? Were you playing with other kids? Was it solitary play? Did you, um, you know, use a lot of imagination? Did you do artwork? Did you go out in nature? Create a play history of those things that you did that made you feel silly and engaged and in the flow, like time didn't exist, okay? Some other things that could help you if you're in a restrictive environment is to surround yourself with playful factors. A great way to do this is to have pets. So I've got two dogs and a cat, and if you've ever seen dogs engage in play and roughhousing, you know what I'm talking about. It inspires you to get beyond that sense of restriction and to see the natural instinct and release that comes from engaging in play. Okay, so do a play history, observe animals, and be around kids. Engage with other children who are still immersed in that world. And I guarantee by doing these things, you're definitely going to be able to finally reach that next level of being your own eternal optimist and having access to creating an atmosphere wherever you go of beauty. So I hope that helps, Kristen. And what I want to hear from you, Kristen, and other Life Path Threes is what kind of things do you do to feel optimistic and playful. Let's start to have a dialogue about that, about what that might be, and I will comment below as well, okay? Hope you guys are having a great day, and I will talk with you later.